So um, uh, I'm happy to report that your opportunity to escape the state of the school has now passed. Um, and, uh, but I'm so delighted that so many of you um, would like to hear a little bit about how MIT Sloan School is doing um, and maybe have a question or two. Uh, stump the dean is always a good um, uh, time for me. Uh, and so we'll get that um, as quickly as we can. What I'd like to do is to describe for you um, a little bit the environment at MIT and around here in Kendall Square that's been changing so dramatically. Um, if you do have the opportunity, maybe just every five years or so, to come back to campus, I hope you might have seen some things change. Um, they've also been changing with respect to students and faculty, and I want to give you a sense of that, at least, uh, again, very briefly. Um, and give you a brief sense of some of the challenges and opportunities that we see ahead, and then um, take your questions and comments. I'm looking forward to that very much. Uh, you know that uh, along with things like uh, business analytics and manufacturing, innovation and entrepreneurship is um, a core uh, principle and set of activities for us at the Sloan School and for the Institute more broadly. Um, I thought I'd just show you a little um, a uh, map of the campus, and there's um, a point that I want to offer to you. This is a map of the entrepreneurial and innovation activities, the spaces on campus uh, where you can do that. And the point is not that you are able to read every single thing here, um, but to see how much there is, how distributed it is, um, how purpose-built the activities are. Uh, they really are, you know, for a particular kind of purpose, you need a particular kind of um, uh, lab or a particular kind of mentoring um, or a particular kind of makerspace. And that is the way that these things have arisen on campus. Um, if I can just point out the makerspaces themselves, there are six of them. You know, for a lot of uh, universities, you might go visit and you might ask, where is the makerspace, hoping that they have one. And it's probably in the Entrepreneurship Center, and that's where it is. Uh, there are six of them. Uh, one of them is indeed in the Entrepreneurship Center uh, right here, the Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship as part of the Sloan School. Um, where else are the other maker spaces in addition to the individual kind of um, you know, fab lab kinds of activities? So some of them are where the other labs are, but some of them are where student dorms, especially undergraduate dorms are. That's where people live. And as you know, MIT undergrads aren't always in bed by 9 o'clock. And a fair amount of the productive activity that they undertake um, is when it's dark. And it's nice to have access to facilities, which they do have access to, that's essentially 24-7. Um, I also wanted to broaden out the geography a little bit and to remind you about the ways that Kendall Square itself is changing. Um, if you looked back even just five years ago, about half of what you see on this chart outside of the MIT campus, but the area just around the MIT campus, essentially a five-minute walk from the MIT campus, has changed so dramatically. I hope and I think you know about the life sciences and pharmaceutical activity that has uh, really made MIT its global home during the last 10 years. Um, but you also see big companies like Philips and Schlumberger here. Um, you see the computer science-based companies, um, as you just heard with Jeff, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, um, HubSpot, Google, IBM, and so on. Um, you've, um, it's just the, the development of Kendall Square has been extraordinary. Uh, about a year ago, the trustees of Stanford University um, did a road trip together and came to MIT. They wanted to see a few of the faculty, including Eric Brynjolfsson in the um, digital economy work at the Sloan School. Um, but they wanted to understand as well how MIT is managing to do so much work that cuts across the boundaries of engineering and science and management. And their takeaway is the benefit of density, something actually that on occasion here on the MIT campus we, you know, grumble about. You know, sometimes it can be maybe just slightly difficult to find parking. Uh, you probably didn't have any trouble with that, but you know. Um, but on a campus where within a 10 minute walk you can see just about anybody that you'd want to see, that's very different than a campus in which it's at least a 10 minute golf cart ride in order to see the people that you'd like to see. And so a learning for them could be summarized in one word, infill. The desire to build more density on that campus. Now, I mean, those of you who are beginning to worry about Stanford, they'll be okay, they're just gonna be fine. 
but it is nice to get a perspective through others' eyes, in some ways through fresh eyes, about the way that MIT goes about its business and gets a certain kind of activity done very well. Um, you also may have seen the construction site over here on Main Street. It's a billion dollars investment in five new buildings that are rather large. Um, one of them will be a graduate dorm to replace Eastgate. Were there any Eastgate uh, former, um, you know? And so it is my sad duty to inform you that Eastgate is going to be coming down as soon as that graduate dorm is finished. Um, uh, <laughs> sad duty, it's my sad duty to tell you that. Um, but it is my happy duty to tell you that for a very small donation, I'm sure we'll be making available little chunks of concrete from Eastgate. <laughs> as a memorial for those who are interested. Um, but you know, the, so, so much of the rest of the activity, this represents entirely MIT's investment, um, is activity related to bringing more innovation-driven activity, including companies, to the very edge of campus. Um, as may be clear to you, this is the Sloan Building. This is where we are right now, the Tang Center. That's how close this activity is to us, and as soon as this project is finished in about a year and a half. The construction on the Volpe site, which is diagonally one block further across the street, will begin, and that will be another billion dollar plus investment in more activity around Kendall Square. I don't know where everyone's going to park, but I do know that MIT is seen increasingly as the place where the future is going to be invented, especially if it's a positive future. And the desire for organizations to be here is really palpable. Um, for those of you who are fans of, you know, artists' conceptions, this is what Kendall Square, I'm sort of telling you, is going to look like in a year and a half. I don't know. Don't, don't hold me responsible for this particular picture. But this is going to represent a very significant change in the MIT campus. We're not a place that's just about buildings, um, and we never will be. So I want to give you a little bit of a sense of some of our degree programs, some of our faculty activity, some of our activity working across campus, and then, as I said, take questions as you have them. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few facts about our individual degree programs. I hope you may know and remember that we have multiple programs. Um, we have two senior executive programs, the Sloan Fellows Program, which originated the Sloan School itself. Um, which indeed has very senior executives, um, and it is principally at this point an international, non-US population of people who come for a year, amazing people doing amazing things. We have a domestic complement to that program, the EMBA program now, that also has people average age 40, just as the Sloan Fellows are, but is primarily domestic because you come once a month for a four-day period. And the bringing of those two senior executive program participants together um, is a very important part of the school's footprint with respect to education. Um, whoops, y you know the, mm, let's see if I can make that go backwards. That's deliberately a small one. Mm, no, I'm not making that go back. Oh, here we go, maybe. All right, good. Um, uh, diversity in the MBA program um, is always a point of interest for us. Um, one, but not only uh, contributor to that is the fellowship aid, which I'll come back to in a minute, that we offer people. 42% uh, 40 of the MBA students at this time are women. 19% um, of the US participants in the program are underrepresented minorities. I'm not saying that that's something to celebrate. I'm just saying those are the facts as they stand, and they are more than they used to be. The PhD program's admit rate at 5% is um, very, very good um, in terms of selectivity. Um, and equally importantly, we are well able to attract the people that we wish to attract, which is also true on the faculty side, as I'll mention in a minute. The Master of Finance program, relatively new program, um, and the other relatively new program, the Master of Business Analytics, are both pre-experience master's programs. They're 12-month programs. So the average age is essentially 23, 24 of people coming into those programs. I hope that you feel that they represent some of the best of MIT's history and strengths. Um, they do represent some amazing people that we're able to bring to MIT that we wouldn't be able to have here otherwise. Um, this profile of the business analytics students is almost precisely the same GRE exam profile that entering PhD students have in Sloan and in engineering. Um, our students continue to have great experiences. 
Um, they do, of course, meet each other and form a strong community. They also have action learning opportunities around the world. One of the reasons I wanted to show you this set of photos um, is to inform the way that we think about online learning. We are doing more online learning, especially in non-degree executive education and in the early parts of the core activities for MBA students, the more sort of rote kinds of activities. But that's increasingly a small part of what we do in our programs. And so to the extent that the secret sauce in some of our programs is to have people have opportunities to work with an entrepreneurial firm in Vietnam, I don't think that's well reflected in at least the online learning of today. And so we attempt to be thoughtful about taking advantage in a nice way of online learning opportunities and learning about the ways that we're able to deliver activity online. But we don't want to turn into a place that offers less value. We may offer different value, but not less value to people in terms of um, what they get relative to what they would expect to get. Uh, this is a good time to be MIT, and it's a time when people want to be at MIT. Um, our uh, application uh, numbers over the last five years have uh, moved up pretty significantly. Um, over the last 10 years, uh, our applications have increased to the 6,000 number um, that they are here from 3,000 10 years ago. Um, no other leading school has seen that kind of increase. You may know that at many schools, the MBA is not as popular as it used to be. Overall, MBA registrations or applications and participation is down. That is not true of us and of the other leading schools. But if you look at MIT's um, strength internationally in terms of how it's regarded and its focus on innovation and technology and entrepreneurship, um, I think you see quite clearly the, um, and the, by the way, the vitality of um, the Boston region, you see a set of reasons why people continue to be interested in us and why some other programs, Kellogg and Tuck, um, have struggled during the same period. M MBA fellowships are increasingly an important part of just being competitive with other leading schools. Um, we came from a place when I began as dean where we offered fellowship aid to 11% of entering MBA students. It's 37% now. That's about half of the distance we need to travel with respect to fellowship aid in order to be at parity with Wharton and Harvard and Stanford, the places that we compete with the most. It's not our desire to buy any student that should be at a different school. It is only our desire to prevent them from buying students who really do seem the best fit for the MIT Sloan School. And so that's what you see us working on here. We do have one new program over the last five years. It is that Master of Business Analytics program. It's a great program because of the strength of MIT in analytics. Um, it's also a great program in that it connects us better across the MIT campus to scientists and engineers who are interested in those faculty, who are interested in those students. And one of the very nice reflections of this program, which only has um, 40 people in it um, looking to the year ahead, um, is the number of companies at Master of Business Analytics Career Night, which we ran a few months ago. Uh, 60 amazing companies. Um, I, I, we don't have enough time for me to show you the companies, but they're the companies that you would think are coming, both startups and very established um, innovation-driven, analytics-driven companies. Um, over 650 students on the MIT campus participated in that evening. Remember, there are only 40 business analytics students. And so this was an opportunity for master's students, um, PhD students across the MIT campus. About half of them were from other parts of MIT coming and gathering around the Sloan School and around this activity. Again, from my perspective, we are at our best when we aren't just a B school competing in the landscape of other B schools doing B school competition. We are at our best when we are MIT's school, and this program helps us be that in some important ways. Uh, at the undergraduate level, we have um, new um, uh, majors that were launched within the last five years as well. Um, you remember Course 15, I hope, fondly. Uh, there is now um, three flavors of Course 15. 15.1 15 is your same old favorite management flavor. 15.2 is um, analytics. 15.3 is finance. Um, and it, it really is a nice reflection of the interest that undergrads have in, yes, management, but management that feels like it's coming from MIT. 
And just as a branding, um, as well as in terms of content, this helps us to attract undergrads to course 15. And there are also minors that have these same kind of flavor. Um, to touch only briefly on faculty, uh, the last two years have been great in terms of um, attracting new faculty. We've made 26 offers to faculty to join us. 16 of those 26, or 60%, have accepted those offers. Um, that also is a high water mark among other um, leading schools of management. MIT is really an extraordinarily attractive place for people to come. Um, one person who joined us um, from the entrepreneurship group at Harvard Business School said, I don't understand your question about why I'm choosing to join MIT. MIT. <laughs> yes, OK. Um, half of the, um, over the last two years, half of the faculty who have joined us um, are women um, as well. We've needed, in my early time as dean, to invest in compensation for faculty because we were too far behind other leading schools. <coughs> faculty were leaving. They weren't leaving for the money. They were leaving because of lack of confidence that we could control our future. And the way they were able to measure our ability to control our future is what we felt able to pay them. Once they would get an outside offer, we would match the offer, but they had already decided our ability to compete was too limited. So we did work on that during my first five years as dean. What we didn't work on in the ways that we needed to and have now attended to over the last five years is support for the high impact, large scale research that our faculty wish to pursue and are pursuing. When we were raising their comp, you can only do a certain number of things at a time. We needed to raise their compensation first to a level that is not in excess of our peers, but is within a just noticeable difference of our peers. And in this second five years, what we've attended to is, on the right-hand side, the creation of as many new centers, labs, and initiatives as we had when I started as dean. So the stuff on the left-hand side is stuff that's been around for a long time. The stuff on the right side is the places that we've been able to invest in faculty who are pursuing large-scale impact in sustainability, the digital economy, um, entrepreneurship for the developing world, health, health systems, food supply, um, cybersecurity and finance, and in particular, the policy elements of finance. If you look at the way our faculty describe themselves and the work that they do, they don't really think of themselves very much as accounting faculty or marketing faculty or operations faculty. They think of themselves as faculty who are oriented toward making a big difference. You know, if I can say megalomaniacal in a good way. Um, and so they think of themselves as being a person who focuses on global economic development or sustainability or other large scale challenges that need attention. Um, and we continue to produce pretty thoughtful books, I would suggest to you. This is a, a list of the books that were published during the last year or during 2017. Um, and there will be another set this year. Um, with um, an eye on the clock, let me just briefly then touch on cross-campus collaboration and some challenges, and then open it up to questions that you may have. So if we're going to be MIT's School of Management, one of the things that's going to define us is the strength and character of our connection with the School of Engineering. We have a new dean of engineering over the last year, Nanta Chandrakasan. Um, he has been already a huge partner of mine in strengthening the connections between engineering and Sloan, which to be sure were strong before and had been growing and building. Um, but he's taken it to a new level and I'm very um, happy and, and grateful to him for that. As the department head for EECS, Core 6, if you like, um, he started something called um, Startup MIT, which was a very entry level, you know, what the heck does it mean to be an entrepreneur? Got people from all across the MIT campus coming to Core 6 um, to just kind of start to think about what entrepreneurship might mean. PhDs, postdocs, undergrads, all sort of together in a big room. When he started as dean, he said, 
why don't we do this together? Let's make it a Sloan engineering combination. I don't need to own this. We're best when we work on this kind of stuff together. That's, let me say, really rare in academia. <laughs> uh, uh, other new activities have that same kind of character. The MIT IBM uh, Watson AI Lab, uh, where I have a role in leadership. His role is bigger, let's be clear. But um, we're doing that together. IDSS is another example where we work with engineering. And the MIT Innovation Initiative, which now reports jointly to the Dean of Engineering and the Dean of the Sloan School. All of these are settings in which the two schools do work together and need to work together better. Um, one other thing I wanted to just kind of touch on, um, it relates to a collaboration with another school at MIT, the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. Um, you know, we do a lot of action learning around the world. Um, some of that work helps with economic development in various countries. Um, a couple of years ago, one of the school's uh, MIT Sloan alums challenged me a little bit in a setting kind of like this one um, to say, I appreciate that there are economically needy areas around the world and your students are challenged and educated by working in those settings. Do you care about America? And so over the last two years, we've been looking for opportunities and looking for students who want to pursue those opportunities to do some of the action learning that we have been doing in Colombia and Peru, in Chile, in Vietnam and so on, in some parts of the United States that have had challenges with respect to economic development. Um, it's been interesting to find the kinds of local partners that would help us find places where we could both make a difference and learn about making a difference. So this is not to suggest to you that we have the answer to the United States with respect to the opioid crisis and economic development and jobs and so on. But I think to simply say that we produce great graduates who will do good things in really good companies isn't enough. And among the things that our students have been asking us for as well is opportunities to roll up their sleeves and get involved in some communities and to see what they can do and to see what they can learn. And these are some of the places that we did this over the last year. And we'll expand that next year. Um, oh, I need to um, give you a summary of um, our financial health. And in particular, I'm just going to do the very brief version of the support that you all have been very nicely offering us. Um, at, uh, but first, it's my memory of my slides. Um, we have transitions in leadership for the school. I'm very proud of uh, the people who have stepped into these responsibilities. Um, it's always important to bring additional faculty into the leadership mix for the school. And Nelson Repending, who some of you I, th I think know in this room, um, is going to lead the Leadership Center and lead us in leadership initiatives. Um, I have an amazing and new chief of staff in Kristen LeClaire. Um, Bill Garrett I want to touch on as the new chief administrative officer for the school. Um, in one particular sense, during my early years as dean, when we had the need to attract a new dean, Invariably, that person was coming from a global search from another leading institution. We just didn't have enough people with enough experience base or talent in order to grow those people into the positions of leadership that we needed. Bill was the result of a global search for a new CAO for the school, and he happened to have been um, a senior director within the school already. The people that we didn't choose were or became within a month CAOs of two or three of the other leading business schools. And Bill was the person who rose to the top. It's a little bit of a personal point of pride for me to see our human capital developing in those ways. And there's a lot more I could say about developing that human capital, but um, it is really important to all of us. OK, so thank you to those of you who um, know about and participated in Pi Day. Pi Day is two years old. It's a great way to energize the community and have it come together. Um, and was, of course, very um, successful with respect to uh, philanthropic support for the school. To broaden that out a little bit in terms of unrestricted support, it has been um, a great five years. And so far, a great this year with respect to alumni and friends choosing to support the school. Um, with a, um, a, a balanced budget that we have to sustain within MIT, support like this matters a great deal as we take on new things to do. Um, some of our peer schools um, do raise more money than we do. 
Um, it is also fair to say that we are getting closer to them with respect to where we stand, and um, I'm very proud and pleased and grateful for that. You know that MIT has a campaign. Our goal within that campaign has been $300 million. Um, we are getting close to that goal for the school. Um, and this is, in a way, the tip of the iceberg as well. There's about another $150, $170 million that Sloan alumni have given to the rest of MIT. It kills me. Why are we doing that? No, it's not. Actually, I'm very proud of it. And it helps us, again, with our strength and connections across campus. OK. Um, these campaign events that we've been running around the country and around the, world, around the world are not only a way to raise money, they're also a way to build community, and they've been doing exactly that. So every school's got challenges as well as opportunities. Uh, building community, sustaining a culture that's distinct for this school is something that we work on all the time. Um, I mentioned online learning before. The future is changing. I'm not really worried that someone's going to come along and eat our lunch through online learning. It's more an opportunity than a threat at this point. But the ways that we build or see is that opportunity continue to be important for us to think about. Um, with respect to global engagement, this is a very important time for MIT and the Sloan School to be visible in the right ways around the world. Our percent of the entering class at Sloan that comes from outside the US dropped a couple percentage points this year. Can I get a visa to study? The answer is that you can, but not enough know that. Will this be a welcoming community for someone from other parts of the world? It will be, but not enough people know that. Can I get a job that I would like after I finish this program? The answer is yes, but not enough people know that. And so building our visibility and our sense as a welcoming place around the world has never been more important than it is now. And it is something that we work on. And you heard me talk about expanding partnerships across MIT. So we have just a few minutes, but I would love to take questions, comments, criticisms. Um, yes, can we um, have um, a microphone brought right down here? Thanks for your patience. Hi, I'm Mary, class of 1998. Um, on that last point, you said that the percentage of international students dropped a few percent, but what is it? Oh, OK, sure. Um, we are a portfolio of programs across the whole graduate programs for MIT Sloan School. It's almost precisely 50% outside the US, 50% inside the US. So this year, it's more like 49%, 51%. In our MBA program, it's about 35% non-US. But as I said, the Sloan Fellows program is more non-US and so on. Does that get you enough of a sense of this? Thanks for the question. Um. Uh, first of all, let me, uh, Arthur Alexander, class of 58. Yes. Let me, uh, first of all, thank you for your great leadership in your deanship since you arrived here at Sloan. Fantastic job. That's all the time we have. <laughs> I read it just the way you gave it to me. Uh, the question I have is, when I was here, uh, we had only one Master of Science degree in industrial management. And over the years, that morphed into an MBA program and a master's. The differentiation, my understanding, is that the MBAs did not require a thesis, which yes. we did. I don't see that. MS program with a, uh, a, a thesis required. Has that been done away with, or does that still exist? The short answer is that it's been done away with as a requirement. The students can choose, graduate students, master's students, can choose to do a thesis and receive that degree if they wish and have a faculty advisor advise them. To give you an illustration, out of about 100 Sloan Fellows graduates this year, the number who did a thesis and received that degree was one. And the degree was MS in business? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. So that's the short answer. Thanks. OK. Ah. Hi. Um, I was in the class of 2008. And I know back at that time, there was a lot of focus on growing MBA programs through partnerships internationally, specifically yes. in China. Yes. 
and in the Middle East, in um, uh, like the UAE. And uh, I'm curious what has happened with that and if the political situation has changed the priority or the calculus of those partnerships. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, so um, as I think probably all of you know, MIT has decided, this is the institute broadly, not to do dual degree or joint degree programs with other universities. And so, I mean, that um, is, in a sense makes my life easy because I don't have to think about it because I know it's not going to happen. But we still have you know, an opportunity to argue for it or against it. Um, and of course, to be mindful about the experiences of others. And so um, we are able to serve as the um, sponsor or advisor to other programs as long as it's not our degree. And we do serve that role with the leading business um, program in China among China's top universities, Tsinghua University's um, international MBA program. Um, so it is not an MIT degree. Um, uh, some of the graduates do um, get welcomed to MIT events, which I love. Um, in fact, some of their graduates choose to come to our PhD program, which is also great. Um, it's the reason I um, have the invitation to meet with President Xi when I'm in China once a year um, um, is because of the role that we play in that program. Um, but it isn't a dual degree or a joint degree program. Um, in the Arab Middle East, um, the European schools were the ones who, to a large degree, except for Carnegie Mellon, are, are the ones that chose to take up the opportunity to do a degree program and to be incented to do so in the region. Um, I, I'm just you know, asking you not to put this on the internet, but those schools have not had a positive experience in doing so. Um, and uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, but it, it's, no one's looking to do those programs in that region in that way at this time. Um, that's not to say that the landscape internationally isn't dynamic. It's really dynamic. And there are, um, uh, but you know, um, <laughs> one of the things that you rapidly see is how today's place that is really very much on the rise and optimistic about its future, say 10 years ago, Istanbul and Turkey, you know, I mean, 10 years makes a big difference. And we try to build business school opportunities for 100 years, not 10 years. And so um, we try to be thoughtful about where we will plant a certain kind of flag. Um, it doesn't come with guarantees. Um, uh, I'm proud of the work that we've done in Malaysia as that country has attempted to build um, a world-class business school. Um, we've helped them for about five years now. Um, the first couple of years, that particular founding sponsorship, again, it's not our degree, it's their degree, but we serve as the partner and sponsor, um, was uh, sponsored by the uh, Malaysian Central Bank, Bank Negara. Uh, they are, as a central bank, revered around the world for their discipline and austerity and so on. Um, as you may know, there have been some political challenges in the country of Malaysia. Um, that central bank governor was um, eased out. Um, that successor central bank governor has now just a couple weeks ago been eased out. But in the um, political winds of the last month, um, the person who led the central bank so effectively during the Asian financial crisis, who was forced out um, by the prior government, has now been named as one of the five um, esteemed elders of the country, and so we're back. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, these things don't come with guarantees. I think it's a source of great anxiety if those kinds of situations are our degree. Um, it's a different kind of anxiety um, if it is our brand but we know why we're there and we know what we're trying to help with. Ah, and so, uh, you know, I, I think I want to be a little bit respectful of people who need, need maybe a bio break. And the innovation showcase in this room is going to start in nine minutes. Um, and so I know you're, let me not go there. Anyway, <laughs> um, let me say thank you very much for caring about MIT. Thank you for great questions. Mm -hmm.